Well, good morning and welcome to worship as we gather as God's family of faith in his house to sing his praises, receive his gifts of grace and mercy. We do so knowing that Jesus is with us in the midst of all things, including our pain and suffering as we celebrate that goodness of Jesus in all things. I invite you to stand for our opening hymn number 507. gather to worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. What is man that you are mindful of him? Amen. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Amen. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You are invited to kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent confession and self-examination.
we confess our sins together. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The psalm of the day comes from Psalm chapter 81. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Sing aloud to God our strength. Raise a song, sound the tambourine. Blow the trumpet at the new moon. For it is a statute for Israel. He made it a decree in Joseph. I hear a language I had not known. Your hands were freed from the basket. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. There shall be no strange God among you. I am the Lord your God. Oh, that my people would listen to me. We join together in singing the Kyrie. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is our true Sabbath rest. Help us to keep each day holy by receiving his word of comfort, that we may find our rest in him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture readings. The Old Testament reading comes from Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15, and can be found in the Pew Bible, page 150. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your ox, or donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson comes from 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 12. can be found in your pew Bible, page 965. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said... Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the second chapter. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat? and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? to save life or to kill. But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. In response to God's word, we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May we see it as we join together in singing hymn number 919.
invite you to open a Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our epistle reading this morning, or you can follow along in the bulletin reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word this morning, we go to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds, that the gospel would be proclaimed to our hearts and minds of the Holy Spirit, and that he would uplift us and encourage us in faith. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they would hear the gospel proclaimed to their hearts and minds, that the Holy Spirit would encourage them, uplift them, and comfort them with the hearing of the word of God. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Right? Some of you are familiar with that phrase. Um, I heard that, my wife and I heard that about a bajillion times. It's a really big number. When we served out in Maryland, they would say it all the time during the service to, to one another. We had friends that would say it all the time, and eventually... I got to be honest with you, I got a little annoyed with it. I was like, okay, yeah, I get it, right? We say it a lot. God is good. He's good all the time. I'm, I'm there with you. We have to say it every 30 seconds, all right? But one of the people that said it the most was a good friend of ours named Jeff. He would always say, I'd ask him, how you doing? He'd always just say, God is good, pastor, all the time, God is good. And that was his answer to almost everything. He loved the Lord. He had this joy in the Lord. And you wouldn't know how much suffering Jeff and his wife, Wendy, were always going through because he had this joy. He, he was perpetually joyful. He would always just say, God is good all the time. And Jeff, once you got to know him, you knew he really meant it, right? Sometimes we can say it just to say it because, you know, I said it and out of habit, half of you started responding to me even if I didn't ask you to, right? So sometimes we say things out of habit, but Jeff really meant it. He believed it to his core that God was good all the time, no matter what was happening. And a lot of this pain and suffering that they're going through had to do with Wendy's health. She was going from one surgery and procedure to the next over and over and over again, always on the prayer list, always needing prayers, always needing comfort and encouragement because she was going through something and her body was failing in a unique and different way each time. One time, I asked her because she was such a stalwart of the faith. She believed just as much as Jeff did that God is good all the time, that I asked her, could you, could you share your testimony, your story with me one, one time? Could you just write it out? And she wanted to write it out because she didn't know how long she would live. And so she wrote it out, and it became this folder that I have filled with all these notes about God's faithfulness to her, along with dozens and dozens and dozens of surgeries and procedures and illness and sickness and everything like that. Well, after we moved away from Maryland to serve another church, um, Wendy passed away. And I remember calling Jeff up and going, well, how you doing, Jeff? And he goes, well, Pastor, God is good all the time. And Jeff believed it, right? His wife had passed away. They had gone through decades and years of pain and suffering. And his response to the pain and the suffering in the world was, God is good all the time. It's hard to believe, right? We can say it. How many of you agree that God is good? Just show of hands, right? The hard part of that phrase is believing it all the time, right? Go, God is good, but does it feel like or does it seem like God is good all the time? And that can be difficult to believe. This is why Jeff and Wendy were such an encouragement to my heart to know them and to pastor them, because they really believed it, despite having every excuse in the world to set it aside and say, yeah, he's not really that good. In our reading today in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is going to share a very famous passage with you. And I'm going to jump back. It's not in the, the uh, bulletin. It's in the text, though. Back to verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. So Paul is writing this whole section 
to encourage the church, to encourage believers in Christ to not lose heart. And he's saying, we have this ministry. So he's saying, we're in this together. We all have a ministry to serve Jesus, to make disciples of all nations, to tell people about Jesus and his love and his grace and his mercy for them. And he's saying, I don't want you to lose heart because guess what's easy to do when life piles up on you? Lose heart. You get frustrated and you say, I'm done with this place. I'm done with those people. I'm done doing this. I'm done doing that. You get hurt, you get wounded, and you say, I can't forgive, I can't love anymore, I can't give anymore, right? The devil creeps in and says, well, look at all that's happening to you. Look at the illness, look at the suffering, look at the sickness, look at whatever is going on in your life, look at the loss of financial freedom and the financial provision that you are going through. And the devil wants to creep in with all these things, all these things of suffering in our life, and get us to believe what? That we should lose heart, that we should quit and that we should give up. And Paul says, I'm gonna write something to you so you don't lose heart. Because it's easy to believe the lies of Satan that convince us to lose heart and give up in this thing called following Jesus and sharing his love. And so he writes in verse five, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, For Jesus' sake. So he's saying, we're not proclaiming ourselves, and he's writing, and it's him and Timothy and Luke and some other friends that have been missionaries. They started the church in Corinth, and he's saying, we're writing to you not to talk about ourselves. So the focus and the center of Paul's ministry and preaching is not Paul himself, but Jesus Christ. So the root of how you and I have a foundation of not losing heart is that we make our faith all about Jesus. Right? And I know this is really simple because I teach it to the kids in preschool when we have Bible story time and they get it, so I know you get it, but how many times do we forget it? And it's like, oh, no, I get it. Yeah, Jesus is cool. And then we move on to the next thing. We forget that Jesus is Lord over every area of our life. The reason Jeff and Wendy could say God is good all the time is because they knew Jesus is in control over everything, that he was Lord over every area of their life. One of my favorite movies growing up was The Lion King, the animated version, because I'm old, okay? Anybody seen this movie before? One of my favorite scenes is when Mufasa and Simba are sitting there and they're looking at the whole kingdom, the whole area of Africa, and he says, everywhere the light touches belongs to us. And then Simba goes, well, what about that one dark, patchy area? And he goes, we don't go there, right? And here's what we do as human beings, We sit down with Jesus, and we're like, Jesus, everywhere the light touches in my life belongs to you. And then Jesus goes and points to that one area you won't give to him. He goes, well, what about that part of your life? He goes, you don't go there. That area belongs to me alone. But Paul's saying, we proclaim Christ and not ourselves. It's his way of saying, my whole ministry, my whole life is about Jesus. So Paul's also saying in this text, my life belongs to Jesus, meaning every area of it, not just your worship service, not just Sunday school, not just the times where you're serving the Lord and volunteering, but your whole life belongs to Jesus. And this is the grounding, the foundation for how we can say God is good all the time. I really mean it. This is how we can join Paul in saying I'm not going to lose heart because Jesus is the foundation of my life. In Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says that he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so he begins our faith. He he begins our faith, but he also perfects it and sustains it. And so the first thing we have to do, if you want to join Paul in saying, I don't want to lose heart despite what is happening around me or to me. I want to keep going, I want to keep following Jesus, I want to keep serving Jesus, is you got to make Jesus the foundation of your whole life. Not just a little bit of it, but the whole thing. And then he says, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Anybody done something good and had nobody notice? Or you did something good and nobody said thank you or gave you a plaque to recognize it? And how frustrating that is, right? That's not fun, right? I'm not bringing it up to be like, well, you should just keep soldiering on, right? 
That is difficult. That's a way we lose heart. That's the way Satan convinces us to give up and to lose heart is that we go, well, I'm not getting any appreciation. I'm not getting any recognition. And what Paul says is, I'm a servant. We're all servants. There's not a single one of us that's not a servant because Jesus said, I'm a servant, so you have to be a servant. And if anybody had an excuse to not be a servant, it was Jesus, right? And he says to his disciples, I want you to be servants of all. And so Paul says, we ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So the question becomes, why are you serving? Why do you serve in the church? Why do you serve people in your neighborhood? Why are you kind to people at work? Why are you serving them? And Paul would say the reason being is not to get the thank you, as great as that feels. It's not to get the recognition that we so desire. But he says it is to give glory to Jesus. For Jesus' sake means that the whole point of serving is to make sure that people learn about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about being the salt and the light of the world. And he says the whole reason you and I are the salt and light of the world is not so people go, wow, you guys are really awesome. We go, thank you. It is so, Jesus says, that they will praise your Father in heaven. So it's not that they're going to praise you, not that they're going to thank you or recognize you, but so that they would praise your Father in heaven. Paul saying just what Jesus said, that they would glorify Jesus, they would worship Jesus, they would make much of Jesus. So one of the ways we don't lose heart when it comes to serving and following Jesus is that we make it about Jesus, right? That's really hard, though, <laughs> because we want to make our lives about who? Us. How many of you have an ego? How many of you are willing to admit you got an ego problem, <laughs> at least some days, right? We want it to be about us. We want, we want it to be about the center of our lives being us, not Jesus. This is actually how Luther described what sin is. He called it navel gazing. It means we're always looking in at our belly buttons, which is a weird way to describe it, but what he means is we're always looking inward. We're always looking at ourselves. And he says that's the root of sin. We're not looking out for other people. We're not looking out for the glory of God. We're looking inward at ourselves. And Paul says, here's the cure for that. You make it about Jesus. If they get to learn about Jesus, they get to learn a little bit more about his love, his kindness, his mercy. Paul would say, then it was all worth it. In fact, if you read Philippians chapter one, Paul is under arrest. And he's he's not complaining. He's talking about how people are trying to cause him trouble while he's in jail. And Paul says, but what does it matter? And if it was you or me in jail, we would say, it matters a lot, (laughs) right? Because this is annoying. I'm already in prison. I'm already suffering. And these people are trying to make it worse. And Paul says, but what does it matter as long as the gospel is proclaimed? See, Paul's cure for us having not giving up and not losing heart when it comes to serving the church and serving others and serving Jesus is that we make it about Jesus. And if we make it about Jesus, as long as Jesus wins, then we win and we're okay with it. As long as people praise Jesus and learn more about him, we go, amen, this is awesome. It's not about me, it's about him. Verse six, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying is there's darkness in the world. How many of you are already aware of that? I didn't have to tell you, right? There's suffering, there's pain in the world, there's darkness in your world, in your life, in your family's life. And he's saying Jesus is the light that shines in that darkness. Now here's the deal, why that's so important, right? I know you learned that song as a kid, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, right? How many of you are familiar with that one? When my little sister, who just graduated high school, which makes me feel old because she's not so little anymore, all right, (laughs) when she was real little, one of her favorite songs was that song, and she would shout, no, right, when you say, are you going to hide under a bush when you cover your finger, right, and she would just shout out no and throw her hands in the air and then shout, I'm going to let it shine, right? So we learn this as little kids, and we go, that's neat. I want you to believe what Paul is saying here is that it's not just a kid's song. There really is darkness and pain and sorrow in this world. And the answer to that darkness, what conquers that darkness, is the light of Jesus. Not you trying harder. 
not you putting more effort in it, not you being stronger or tougher on your own, but trusting the light of Jesus that overcomes the darkness through his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness of sins. And this is what Paul is saying because he, Paul knows something about suffering. He's gone through great deals of suffering for the Corinthian church and for all kinds of churches that he wrote letters to and that we don't have letters about. And he's saying, I want you to know the reality that there is darkness in the world, but Jesus shines his light in it and he is greater than the darkness. Because you and I are gonna hit moments in life where we need that truth. You and I are gonna come to points in our life where we're gonna have nothing to hold on to except the light of Jesus. And Paul's saying, I want you to believe it. I want you to know it, that his light shines out of the darkness and it's shown in our hearts. And then this leads to how you and I become a witness to the world like Jeff and Wendy. That people go, well, they really mean it when they say God is good all the time. They really mean it when they say Jesus saves and Jesus loves and Jesus forgives and Jesus is good. Because when we let that light shine out of us, it becomes a witness to the world. Because then people go, well, how are you so hopeful when there's so much pain in your life? How are you so hopeful when there's so much pain and suffering around you or in your loved one's lives? How are you so hopeful when the world is dark? And the answer becomes, well, Jesus is the light of the world. And he's shining in my heart. Right, first Peter, he says, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you. And the hope that is in us is not you being able to quote Bible verses. The hope that is in you is that Jesus shines his light in the darkness. And the reality of life is there's always darkness. So we always need the light of Jesus. And so does your neighbor. And so do the people in your life and in your family and at your work. They need the light of Jesus too. And so this is why Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. So we have a treasure inside of us is what he's saying. We're the jars of clay. And the word for jars of clay here in the Greek means it's something that was made to be broken, right? This is not a fancy vase or vase if you're really fa fancy, right? All right, I grew up saying vase because I'm from the country, all right? Just leave me alone. <laughs> It's not something that you set up for decoration or put flowers in. It was made to be disposable, something to fall apart. And so Paul's saying, that's what we are. We're falling apart, literally falling apart. You get older and you start falling apart, right? Some of you are telling me to shut up, right? Okay. <laughs> but that's what happens, right? Because sin deteriorates our bodies. It deteriorates the world. We start falling apart. And he's saying, look, this is what's happening. But we have a treasure inside of us to show that the surpassing power belongs to who? God and not us. So the power that's in us that we proclaim to the world, that we share to the world, as Paul said earlier, is the power of God, the power of Jesus, not ourselves. We don't tell people, well, here's how I got through it. I was just really brave. I was just really strong, right? It's the same thing as when you are stressed out and worried about something and someone tells you don't worry about it, how useless that advice is, right? It's the same thing. People need more than to just good advice. They need actual good news. And that's what the gospel is. So Paul's saying, we have this treasure built up inside of us. Yeah, we're frail, we're fragile. We're gonna crack under the weight of sin and the darkness of the world. But inside of us is this treasure that won't go away. And that treasure is the power of God. And in Romans, Paul describes the power of God as this. He says, the power of God is what raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he goes on to explain that if the power of God that raised Christ to Jesus from the dead is at work in you, what can't he do? What can't he overcome for you? What can't he accomplish for you? And the answer to why we can say God is good all the time and he can accomplish anything, and the Bible says over and over and over again, all things are possible with God. It's one of the most beautiful verses in the whole Bible. It's also one of the hardest things to believe, right? If you're being honest with me. It, we believe it, we know it, but it, it's hard to believe sometimes. And the reason Paul says you can believe that is because that power of God raised Jesus from the dead, and he's the evidence that God can do anything. And that's the power that's at work in you. That's the power that's at work in you and I when we are facing the darkness of the world. We feel like our jar of clay is cracking and crumbling all around us. Paul says, but you still have this treasure that won't go away. It's the power of God to raise Jesus from the dead. 
And then he has this beautiful poem. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Isn't that beautiful? It sounds great. It sounds wonderful. It's been turned into songs and hymns. It's this wonderful passage. But here's why it's true. Because sometimes, how many of you want to argue with Paul? Just, be, just being honest. You're like, I'm, I'm perplexed and I'm driven to despair. All right? I'm afflicted and I feel crushed. Right? I'm being persecuted. I'm being mistreated. And I feel forsaken by God. Right? Sometimes we want to argue with Paul and say, actually, Paul, you know what? Looking at my life, it doesn't feel like what you're saying is true. It doesn't necessarily feel like I should not lose heart. It feels like I should give up. It feels like God isn't good all the time. Here's the reason these two beautiful verses are so true for you, even in the midst of extreme darkness. And the answer is Jesus. I know that might surprise some of you that I said that. But the answer is Jesus. Because Jesus was the one who was crushed on our behalf. Right? Isn't that what Isaiah 53 says? That he was crushed for our iniquities? Jesus is the one who was driven to despair where he cried tears of blood on our behalf. Jesus was the one that was forsaken on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was the one that was struck down and destroyed when he was laid in the grave dead. The reason Paul is saying these verses is not just so you, he's not just trying to encourage you and say, you can, you can get stronger, you'll get through this, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. No, he's saying these things to you because they're true for you. And they're true for you because Jesus became all of those things on your behalf so you don't have to. So you can say, I am afflicted but not crushed. I am perplexed but not driven to despair. I am persecuted but not forsaken. I am struck down but not destroyed because Jesus became all those things for me on the cross through his suffering and his death on my behalf. So I can say, I have a treasure inside of me. I have the power of God at work in me. And then when you know that and you believe that Jesus has done all that for you, Paul says, then you will share it with the world because you won't be able to keep it a secret. You won't be able to hide the light. You won't be able to hide the treasure. You will instead share it with the world that is in darkness and in desperate need of the good news of Jesus. This is what he says in verses 10 through 12. Always caring in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. What Paul's saying is, I'm dying to myself every day so that I can follow Jesus, so that more people will know about Jesus, so that more people will know about the light of Jesus that shines in the darkness, that more people will have a treasure in them that is the power of God who raises the dead. So we don't lose hope. We don't lose hope for ourselves. Because Jesus has done this for us. He has suffered and died and risen for us and given us the light that shines in the darkness. And dear friends, we don't lose hope for others. Because how many of you have someone you're praying for? You have someone in your life that needs the comfort and the hope of Jesus. Maybe they haven't said yes to Jesus yet. Maybe they haven't come to faith or they haven't accepted an invitation to church yet. And Paul said, well, don't lose hope. Don't lose heart, don't give up, keep shining that light in the darkness because death is at work in us, but life is at work in them. Jesus is at work in them, and Paul says, don't lose hope. Don't lose heart for yourself. And I would encourage you, don't lose heart for others. To keep sharing the gospel, keep shining the light through your good deeds, and keep praying because you never know when Jesus will break through in their heart and they will say yes to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have suffered and died in our place, that we are able to hold on to these words of hope, that we do not have to lose heart because you went to the cross in our place, and that the power of God that raised you from the dead is at work in us today. May we trust the good news that you are good all the time. 
May we share that hope with the world around us, a world that desperately is in need of your light shining in their darkness, that we would not lose heart in sharing the gospel and the hope of eternal life. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we go to our God in prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of all light and power, you shine upon your creatures and eradicate all darkness that lies within them. Destroy the darkness our sin has caused in our lives. Help us to shine the light of your grace and truth into the world. Lord, in your mercy. Bless the fields and orchards with good weather that all people may be well supplied and filled with awareness of your mercies. Grant that we may show forth grateful and generous hearts within your church and in the world around us. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, be the strength and song of those who are afflicted in both body or mind, as well as those who suffer in our midst. Lord, in your mercy. Give repentance and faith to all who receive our Lord's body and blood today, that in the unity of a true confession, they may receive it for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated to continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings. Please stand for the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. 
Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruits, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he's betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand to receive the communion blessing. This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing Nunc Dominus. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, two brief announcements. One is that we have a voters meeting coming up on June 23rd after the service, so that'll be around 1030. We'll have time for fellowship, and then we'll regather you like herding cats, but we'll get you back in here for the voters meeting on June 23rd, um, so please plan to be, be part of that if you are a member. Um, we have important matters to discuss as a congregation, and then uh, we have a presentation today after service, so we're going to do the benediction and the final hymn. And then we'll have you sit down. If you're a member, we'll have a presentation from our construction committee to give you an update on the construction project and the upcoming logistics that will happen as the construction begins uh, shortly. So with that, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.